Welcome back everyone. Previously, we just saw how to run a simple recurrent neural network on our sine wave data. Let's go ahead and check out how the performance compares to using LSTMs. We also saw that it can take a long time to train these recurrent neural networks, as we saw up here. And we also know that it could get noisy as we train for more and more epochs. So let's introduce how we can use early stopping in conjunction with the fact that we're fitting to a generator. Because passing in the validation data, in our case, we need to pass it in in the same batch shape as a generator's doing. So we essentially need to create two generators, one for our training data and one for our validation or test data. To do this, we'll start off by setting up our early stopping just as before. We'll say from TensorFlow, .keras, .callbacks, import, early stopping. And we'll create an early stop variable just as before by saying early stopping. In our case, we're also going to monitor that validation loss. And we can decide on a patience, basically how many epochs are you going to keep waiting until uh, this early stop actually takes into effect. And for recurrent neural networks, I would recommend a higher patience than just patience equals zero because they can get pretty noisy sometimes. So it's, it's probably nice to wait a couple more epochs just to make sure that we're not in a noisy territory and then going back down with our loss. Okay, so there's our early stopping mechanism. Now what we need to do is create a validation generator. So I will say validation generator is equal to, and I'm going to use the same time series generator as before, except this time it's our scale test data. That's the source of the X in our scale test data, that's the source of the y. And then I need to define length equal to length, and then batch size is also equal to one. Now pay attention to what happens when I try to just run this as is. I will get an error, and this is a really common error, especially for beginners. So they set everything up just as they did with the training generator, and they think, well, what's actually going on here? Well, here's the problem. Right now, our validation set is essentially looking at the exact same length as the entirety of our test set. So what needs to happen is this scaled test data set must be greater than the length chosen for our batches. And that's essentially a sacrifice we have to make in order to actually run this validation generator. And the reason, again, we're getting this error is because right now it's trying to essentially follow this protocol and it's going to be disallowed. You can't have your start index plus the length of your training batch equal to 50 when our end index is essentially one short of it because our length of the batch is the exact same size as our test set, which doesn't make sense. We're essentially missing that future singular Y point. So what we'll have to do is also redefine our original generator to have a shorter length. So we're going to have to, and you can do this in another cell or the same cell, but we're going to say length, it can't be the same size as our scale test data. So previously our scale test data, that was going to be a length of 50. We'll go ahead and shorten it by one to make sure everything's okay. So now we'll say generator, and this is now our training generator, is a time series generator, pass in our scaled training data as a source of our X and Y, and then length is equal to length, and the batch size is one. And now that the length of our batches is shorter than our scaled test set, we should be okay. And essentially what the validation generator is going to do is it's going to keep testing um, on that test range as we actually predict. So now what it can do is take 49 points and predict point number 50. And keep that in mind that technically we're actually just checking the accuracy of one of these points because of how close our test data is to our length. If we had it as 50, that wouldn't make sense for the validation set because our validation set is only 50 long. We would need that 51st point to actually check against, which is why we were getting that error. So again, make sure that if you start creating these validation generators, the length here of this batch has to be at least one shorter than your test data. Otherwise, you'll be missing that predicted point. Okay, so now that that's ready to go, we have our generators in place, let's go ahead and create our models. So I'm going to just copy and paste the same model we created before. Let me comment out these previous test predictions 
and scale data. We'll come back here, grab our model. So I will copy this, scroll all the way down here, paste it in. And what we're going to do here is the only thing we need to do is during our fit step, we need to add in the fact that we're producing a validation generator. The other thing we're going to do is instead of a simple RNN call, we'll call LSTM. We'll go ahead and run that. And then we'll say model fit generator and then say generator. And in this case, you can make epochs pretty large because we're working on this validation generator that we can say our validation data is equal to this validation generator, which is nice. And then we just have to make sure to add in that callback that we just defined by saying callbacks is equal to, and in the list we just pass in early stop, and then we'll go ahead and run this. So we set it for 20 epochs. Hopefully it doesn't need to train for actually 20 epochs. I'm gonna fast forward in time until this is done training. Okay, so I finished training this. It only had to train for six epochs. Let's go ahead and run our evaluation on the test set just as we did before. And we can use the exact same code for this. So we'll come up here, reset our test predictions, go ahead and copy this. Come back down here, evaluate the test predictions for that range. And the other thing we're also going to do is make sure that we do the inverse transform for our test predictions. So I'm going to run this just as before. And essentially, I just copied these three lines from our notebook, but it's the exact same lines we did before. We'll say true predictions is equal to the inverse transform of this test predictions. I'm going to overwrite my current test predictions to be true predictions. But what we can do is go ahead and call this LSTM predictions is equal to true predictions. And then we'll run this and now we'll have three columns. And so now I can see the predictions from my normal RNN, the predictions from the LSTM here in green. And we can see that the green tends to be performing really quite well towards the end, although it's overshooting here in the middle. And that is also kind of an artifact of the fact that we're essentially really just focusing on that last end prediction point, which makes sense given the way that we're using a batch length of 49 and our test set was 50. So it actually might be better to either increase the test data and keep the length of 49 or 50, or keep the test data at 50 and then uh, lower the actual length of that batch size. So here are all our comparisons against the actual uh, data itself. And now let's go ahead and see how it works if we were to forecast this into the future. So let's imagine that I want to actually forecast this beyond 50. Recall that our original data frame, if I plot the data out, it only goes up to 50. So let's see how we can forecast essentially a sine wave or something similar to it beyond that x is equal to 50. So what we should be doing here is I should be retraining on all my data. So I'm going to essentially just copy and paste a couple of commands from the notebook. So this is all stuff we've seen before. I will scale all my data. So fit transform on all my data because now I'm forecasting into the future. And what I have to decide here is that I have to look either at this orange line or this green line and decide, you know what? I'm satisfied with this performance. Let's go ahead and retrain on everything and forecast into the future. So this is me scaling everything. So we have our full scaled data. And then what we're going to do is we'll go ahead and create our generator. So we'll do this off the scaled full data now. Go ahead and create that generator. And then we'll use the same model as before. So let's redefine our model again. We'll go ahead and say model is equal to sequential. Grab this guy. Come back down here. Define our model. And then finally, let's go ahead and fit our model to the generator. So we'll say model dot fit generator. And we'll say fit it to the generator. And then previously it took, if you look on the LSTM data set here, it took six epochs. So let's just go ahead and train for six epochs. We'll say epochs is equal to six. Go ahead and run that. And I'm going to fast forward in time until that's done training. Okay, this is done training. So what I'm going to do is come back and use our same loop that we did earlier. So we'll paste it here, except now I'm not predicting on my test range. Instead, I'm going to forecast. 
And here I get to decide how many spaces do I want to forecast into the future? So for I in range what am I actually going to forecast? So let's go ahead and forecast, let's say 25 points into the future. And then what I'm going to do is instead of calling these test predictions, these are really just forecasts. And there's no way I can evaluate these truly because my original data set doesn't have anything to compare these values to. So we'll go ahead and run this. And now I have my forecast. So I have my original data frame and I need to take my forecast, inverse it, or invert the transformation. So let's say forecast is equal to scalar dot inverse transform on my forecast. And now that the forecast is inverted, all I need to do is take my forecast and get an index for it that corresponds to the points that it was actually forecasting for. So I know that my original data frame, if I take a look at it, it ends at 50.0 which means with a step size of 0.1 here, my very first X point or X index for my forecasting should be at 50.1. So how do we actually see that? Well, I'll just create a forecast index using that logic. I'll say my forecast index is equal to NPR range, starting at 50.1, go to, and in this case, I have to think how many points that I actually predict into the future. So if I do a little math here, I know I predicted 25 points into the future with a step size of 0 0.1. So that's going to be a total of 2.5 added to this guy. So that should be 52.6, whoops, there we go. So that should be my X range with a step size of 0 0.1. So that's my forecast index. So let's make sure of that. We'll check the length of my forecast index and it's 25 points, which is the exact same length as my forecast. So just a little bit of math there to make sure those X's line up with my predicted Y values. And then what we're going to do is we'll simply plot it. We'll say plt dot plot, plot my original data, it's index versus sign here. So that's my original data. And on the same plot, we'll say plt plot, plot my forecast index versus my forecast. And there you have it, we can see those 25 points. And the reason you see a big gap here from this point to this point is because these are two separate, uh, essentially series. So there's no line that automatically connects them here. However, what you could do is bind these together using pd.concatenation or concat, and then it would just be one continuous data frame. All right, so that's it. We were successfully able to compare against a test set, but also show you how to forecast into the future. Coming up next, what we're going to do is we are going to show you how to run all of this on a real time series data set. Okay, thanks, and I'll see you there.